Okay, welcome ladies. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and as I hit record, I look around for a copy of the book, which is just here. <laughs> um, Recipe for a Perfect Wife uh, is the Girly Book Club's book of the month this month, which is the month of April. I have to remember, I get very confused these days. Um, okay. We're very thrilled to have Karma Brown on the line with us uh, to discuss the book. I, I got emailed so many questions <laughs> about this book. Um, so it's really an honor to, um, to be able to talk to you. And Karma, you're from Ontario or Canada rather. Yeah, I live in Oakville. Oakville. Okay, so I'm in Burlington, so we're neighbors. <laughs> we are, but we could have almost, I mean, aside from the pandemic, right? Then we wouldn't even be doing it on Zoom, I guess. But yeah, we're neighbors. Um, which is Always. which is cool. Um, so what we usually do to start it off is just ask you to introduce yourself as you're sort of the best, uh, best person to do so. Um, and then ladies, we're going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So you can ask two ways. You can ask in the chat window and I'll make sure that we uh, get that uh, question communicated to Karma or you can raise your hand and ask live. So that's up to you. But um, Karma, go ahead. Okay. I'm Karma. <laughs> and uh, I am a novelist. I have written, I was actually just today trying to figure out how many books I should say I've written because I have five that are on the shelf. Um, no, I have six. See, this is what happens. I have the one nonfiction, which you can see up there is the, the yellow one, but I have five novels on the shelf. I, I have uh, written a rom-com, a holiday rom-com that I can maybe talk about a little bit later, how that came to be. That's coming out this fall with a friend of mine. We co-wrote that under a pen name. And I didn't always want to be an author. Um, I wanted to be a journalist. My goal was to be Katie Couric of the North, and that was who I wanted to be. So I went to journalism school, uh, got out of there. Life threw me a few curveballs, and I started writing for magazines and doing freelance. And at the same time, then we had a, a child. She never slept. So I learned to write at five in the morning. And that is basically when I have written all my novels. Is you know, at 5 a.m. So uh, I, you know, it's been a really fun shift. Like I didn't publish my first book until I was 41. So this is my career for the second half of my life. And it's been just a real joy to be able to write fiction. One of the things that I have just loved to do the most. So that was a, a bit of a meandering introduction, but I can talk a lot, so I just, I, I will hold back so that when the questions come, you, there's time. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you just wrote your books really quickly, because I can't imagine you're much older than 41. <laughs> I, that's a very nice thing for you to say. I will be 49 this year, so I am, yeah, I'm a little past 41 now. 41 feels, yeah. Five books in nine years, that's great. Yeah, it's a lot. It has been a lot of books, <laughs> yeah. but you know, when you get up at five, you can actually accomplish a lot because no one else is up at that time. And so if it's just you and coffee and your computer, it's actually pretty amazing what you can do. All right. So we're going to go straight into um, audience questions and Eunice has her hand up already. So let's do a live one here. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, my my internet is spotty. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, awesome. I really enjoyed the book. I was wondering why you said it in the States instead of in Canada. Is there a, another, like a, what is the Canadian equivalent of New York and the suburbs? Well, I suppose it would be Toronto and I mean, I could have done Oakville, Oakville? Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's this, this thing and I to be honest I don't know how true this is anymore but when I started in publishing I was told that uh, if you want Americans to read your book then you have to set it in the U.S. because they just don't know enough about Canada and so it won't be interesting enough so and the truth is with recipe for a perfect wife I needed a very urban dynamic center that she, that Alice was leaving and but close enough to a suburb so that she could go and have this completely different experience and completely different life, but sort of like that one hour train ride away. 
And that was why I hadn't ever set a book in New York City. So I thought I would do that, but that's why, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, You're muted. Was, yeah, I always do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much for that great question. And before all the Canadians get up in arms, America is a massive market for publishing. So um, I completely understand why you would need to set it in America to appeal to the American audience. <laughs> yeah, it's just, and you know, New York is one of those settings that everyone loves a book set in New York. And it just, it just made sense for this book. I have set one of my books in Toronto. Um, and I always try to put a little piece of Canadiana in every book that I do. So it was Celine Dion in, in this one, mm -hmm. the mention of her. So I always try. Well, that was a great first question. Um, if anybody else wants to ask live, please feel free. We love the uh, cut the audience interaction. One of the questions I got I got time and time again for you, Karma, was about um, it's right. We're going to dive right into characters. Let's and do it, it. About the fact that Nelly was she? I think was his name Richard. I don't have the question yeah. in front of me because yeah. Richard. So they, everybody wants to know if she started poisoning him at the beginning or if. That was uh, just at the very end. <laughs> no, she had been poisoning him all along. So his stomach problems were because she was poisoning him. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so I had that question three times. So yeah. people weren't um, 100% sure about that. I thought yeah. it was very obvious at the beginning that, or at the end that that was what was happening. But <laughs> yeah, she had been doing it all along. I mean, the book didn't take place over that long of a time. Um, so obviously in the flashback scene, she wasn't doing it, but in the present day when you were with her on the page, yes, she was. Just little bits at first, just to punish him a little bit, you know, give him a stomach ache, but. So, well, that was actually something that came up in a book club that I was um, leading last night. And they said, at the beginning, was she just like a little peeved at him? And there was never sort of like that intention that she would follow all the way through. And it was just to yeah. make him feel bad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was the only way that she felt that she could do that. She felt she didn't have a lot of freedom to be able to leave or to make a big change in her life that way and um, get out of the marriage. So yeah, it was sort of like just little mini punishments for him. And Despite the fact that she poisoned him and killed him in the end, uh, nobody objected to that in any of the groups I was in. Everybody thought that was fair game. <laughs> yes, I haven't had anyone upset with Nellie. I have had a lot of people upset with Alice, and I'm sure that will come up. Uh, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time defending poor Alice. But everyone seems to understand that Nellie, you know, this is, this was really for her based on the time that she was in and the way the societal expectations and, you know, she would have been ruined if she left her marriage. And so this was her only way that she felt she could get her independence and her freedom. And because he was so obviously um, abusive and a terrible man, I don't think anyone, I think people were mostly cheering for Nellie. Well, so while we're on that subject, um, Jessica has asked in the chat window um, if you can talk about Alice and Nate's relationship. And I mean, this came up a lot. Um, I know. Because in a lot um, of ways, she was she just lied all the time. <laughs> and yeah. so she, uh, Jessica wants to know their lack of communication and deception with one another. Can you kind of um, elaborate on that, perhaps? Yeah, you know, Alice is such an interesting one for me. If I get hate mail about this book, it's about her. And I do get hate mail about it and about her. Uh, people are so upset. And often I don't respond to those messages. But when I do talk about her in book clubs, I often ask people to think about why they're so, why they hate her or why they really disliked her, why they found her unlikable. And, you know, the truth about Alice is that she's 29, she's young, she was completely transplanted out of a life that was familiar to her. And yes, part of that was her doing, but she's young and she's making mistakes. And I think, you know, women in particular in fiction don't get away with a lot. Men get a lot of slack and, and male characters get a lot of slack for, for making mistakes and for maybe not being quite as likable because really Nate was manipulating Alice like right alongside her. Now you're in Alice's head, so you have a better chance to, to, to really see what she's thinking as she's making some of those decisions. But she was lost. She didn't know what she wanted. 
and she did not know how to communicate with her husband. And so the choices she was making, I mean, it was almost like a snowball effect where she was just trying to stay one step ahead of sort of where her life was going because she wasn't quite ready to just be a mother and to be this sort of modern day housewife. It was a completely unfamiliar life to her. And also losing her job and then being reliant on Nate. Um, you know, that's a tricky thing for someone who's been self-sufficient and has had a career and has had this financial independence. And now to lose some of that confidence because she does, she no longer has an income and therefore then didn't feel she had much of a say. So they were both, you know, Nate is as responsible for everything that happened as Alice is, you know, he was um, trying to get her pregnant when she wasn't ready and being very pushy around that. And he was going to move them across the country without even checking in to see if that was something that, that, you know, she wanted to do. So she had sort of lost her own autonomy in that relationship. Um, but you know what I find so interesting, even my mom, when she read an early draft, she sent me an email and she said, I do not like that Nate, or I do not like that Alice. Nate seems like a really nice man who has just is working very hard. And I don't know why she's just having such difficulty settling into this life that that has been made available to her. Um, but, you know, I, <laughs> I I so if people hated Alice, it's OK. You can hate any of them. It's really OK. But I do think that again, like she is just a young person trying to figure it out, you know, has made some decisions that she's a little boxed into them and doesn't quite know how to get out of it. Uh, that's really it. And then they, they're, ter I mean, they should never be married, those two. And they don't end up staying married for what it's worth. They do split up. Nate goes on to remarry. He has twins with his new wife and Alice happily stays in that house and raises her daughter, whose name is Maud, and uh, gets a big publishing contract. So that's what happens after you turn the page. Okay, so I have a question on that subject. I have another question, but before I go there, I do just want to mention, it's so interesting because because you're so right when you say that, I don't know if it's just a, it's a female thing that we just blame the females, but when you put it out like that, you're right. Like, like she didn't tell him that she got an IUD, which seems like huge, but you're right. He was like, we're moving across the country and she's just supposed to accept that. Yeah. Um, but then you talk about the narrative and how it was seen through her eyes. And perhaps that has a lot to do with sort of like the sides we choose while we're reading the book. Yeah. I mean, she's, it's, she's, um, and also it's fiction. And if I, made her make all the right decisions and she what book would I have I mean there would be no book and then it, it wouldn't be something I would have published and you know things needed to happen people needed to do bad wrong things it always has to be a little bit worse or you don't have a book fair enough so on the subject of you telling us what happens after the last page which is so interesting <laughs> um one of the questions that was emailed in prior to this um, event tonight was what happens to Nellie? They want to know if she got remarried. Nope, she didn't. She had sort of a little bit of a like companionship on and off relationship with uh, the widower who she was at the dinner party with until he died. But she lived in that house. She taught piano lessons to children, tended her garden, um, stayed very close with Miriam until she passed away. And really, you know, she never remarried, never had children. Uh, for her, what she wanted was her freedom. And so she would have never remarried because she didn't want to risk losing that again. So she pretty much got the life that, that made her happy. She did all the things she wanted to do. But she did not remarry. One and done for Nellie. Yeah. Um, so Rita has a question that's very specific and she, and I don't even know that I follow it, but I'm gonna ask you. Okay. She said, I was a little confused by how Miriam knew Nellie was at the hotel and called her there when Nellie said she was going to visit her mom. I was under the impression that the nursing home and graveyard were in two different cities, but she may be wrong. <laughs> so Nellie had left Miriam a phone number of where to reach her. And that's all she said. If you need to reach me, 
this is where you can find me. She didn't tell her exactly where she was or what she was doing. She just said, you know, here's where you can call me. So that's how she was able to, to find her. It's just not on the page. You can't put everything on the page. So does that make sense, Rita? I don't see Rita, but Rita, does that Yes, answer? it does. Thank you. Okay. 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 So one thing that, that made like such a big deal for me were, um, well, the recipes, of course, mm -hmm. um, so great. Although I'm not sure we talked about, there's this great article I should have shared on the Facebook page before we met tonight, but um, somebody in one of the chapters um, shared it. And it's like 25 meals you'd never want to cook from like, like <laughs> the 50 and everything's a jello and everything's a mold. And it's like, yeah. it just looks awful. Um, so I'm not sure that many of these were, um, Interesting. I did want to make the ice cream one. The um, that's good. Yeah. Have you had it? <laughs> yes. We. My daughter and I made it. It was really ugly because we were just not skilled at getting the ice cream. It probably looked a lot the way that Alice's looked. Right. But it was cool because you bake ice cream in the oven, and my daughter thought that was amazing, and it was tasty. It just wasn't pretty. Nellie's would have been beautiful, but mine was not. Did you make all the recipes? Most of the recipes, some of them are family recipes, like the boiled chocolate cookies is a family recipe. Uh, the um, chicken a la king, is that, yeah, that is my Nana. My Nana was not a really great cook, but that was one of the things that she made for us pretty religiously when we would visit her. And the other ones I did make most, not all. I'm a vegetarian, so I did not make meatloaf. <laughs> um, but I've had plenty of meatloaf in my past. So yeah, they, and it's funny, some of the recipes just did not turn out as well because they're, they are old recipes and things are just different. Flowers are different and ovens are different. And so trying to sort out ingredients, um, I had this funny email from someone who had made the busy day cake. And they had used, it calls for sweet milk, which in the fifties was just whole milk. Yeah. And they used sweetened condensed milk along with all the sugar in the recipe. And she was like, it just wasn't very edible. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you basically like tripled the sugar in the cake recipe. So yeah, that's one of those little things that I, I even had to look it up to figure out what sweet milk was in the fifties, but it was whole milk. Well, we had a really interesting conversation last night about like just old recipes that our grand grandmother cooked for us and like tuna fish casserole was front Yes, so much tuna fish casserole. I've had a lot of casseroles. I mean, I'm a, I was born in the 70s and I feel like oh, we just ate casseroles constantly. Like, tuna fish casserole was I still like tuna fish casserole though. I would probably eat that now. With chips? <laughs> yeah with the chips crushed on top. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, some casseroles work. A lot of the, the recipes were, like, as you said, jello filled. I had found one that was a lemon jello with a can of tuna in it and, and then in a mold. And I just thought like, can you imagine lemon jello with tuna? That just sounds like one of the worst things you could put on a table, but so many had these weird jello combinations. So they looked isn't, wild, isn't but acid? I can't imagine they tasted good. Isn't it? Acid? Yeah. Yeah. But an aspic is savory, like in almost entirely savory. It has like that tomato sort of jello like a, uh, I think it's made with tomato juice. And then it has, well, the one that I have every Thanksgiving because we get together with a bunch of people and one of the, one of the women there, it's her family's traditional recipe. So she always brings it. I think I'm the only person who eats it as, outside of her, um, but it has like green onions and, and um, horseradish and tomato juice with jello maybe lemon jello i don't know we probably should just leave the jello mold <laughs> recipe in the past all right so does Jennifer, anybody okay. friends aspect sorry does anyone eat your friends aspect i do oh, she wow. does <laughs> i no, i truly don't mind it i have I, I guess that's weird but i don't mind the aspect i like jello i just there are some combinations i can't 
like little mini, those little mini Vienna sausages in Jello. <laughs> no. Nasty, yeah. Nasty, yeah. All right, so Jennifer Jones has asked a question here in the chat window and it's, um, it's so yeah, so like I was saying um, about the recipes, there's also the old snippets from um, sort of the books and magazines from, well, from a variety of times actually. She um, yeah. said she loved these and um, they were a little bit horrifying, but <laughs> what yeah. made you put those, what was your inspiration for adding those? Well, I knew all along that I wanted the recipes in there for Nellie's chapters and that each one of her chapters would start with her going through this cookbook and finding a recipe that she could, you know, share for dinner or whatever it was, but it would frame what was happening in her life with that um, chapter. And I wanted to do something for Alice, but I just wasn't quite sure what to do. And it was actually my agent who suggested that maybe I look for old fashioned advice, marriage advice, and, and stick some of those pieces into Alice's chapters at the beginning. And then once I started going down that rabbit hole, it was crazy. I mean, I found so many different things and just used the ones that really fit that I felt fit with the chapter, but, but yeah, it was a little enlightening for sure, because, you know, I mean, you hear these stories and you, you you watch shows like Mad Men or whatever it is, you know that this sort of thing, this was the the idea of, of what it meant to be um, a wife at that time. But then to just really see it in a book that is, you know, like that is from that time, it's just there. And this was what was to be accepted. Uh, it's sort of crazy. It's just not that long ago. All right. So, um... Ashna asks, um, there was instances in the book, like Alice's door slamming shut on its own at night or her being locked out, um, which led the reader towards a supernatural presence or her state of mind as she spent her time alone. Was that intentional? Yes, I, okay. So I love horror books. I love books where the house is a character and I so want to write a haunted house book. So I had put actually even more of that stuff in this book because I have this, I grew up in an old farmhouse and I sort of have this thing about houses where I feel like, you know, all the experiences of the people who have lived in that house before you, it's sort of like seeping into the walls and it, it stays in that house. And I wanted that feeling to exist in this book and also for the house to be a bit of a character. And my editor was like, we have to pull some of this out. It's not paranormal. This is not a ghost story. So I did, but then I was like, well, I'm not pulling it all out. So I'm leaving some of it in because, you know, the house is sentient to some degree. So it just, that's my vision. It's staying in. So she let me keep some of it in, which I was very happy about. So yeah, it is a little... Is it haunted? I don't know, maybe a little. <laughs> so to um, explore that a little bit further, Britt actually asks um, if at any point you could have pictured the book going in a different direction with the genre, because at one point she talks about Alice becoming a bit possessed by Nellie's spirit. So maybe it could have been a thriller. It was, so there was a very different ending to this book when I sold it. And then in, chatting with my editor, my editors, we were trying to sort out what we wanted Alice's story to be in the end and what her agency would be with this, with her story. Um, and so, I mean, I can tell you initially what happened at the end of the book is that Alice did actually go a little off the rails and she started to impersonate Nellie in and not in the way that she sort of does in the current version of the book, where she's just sort of trying on, you know, a persona, trying on an outfit, seeing how it feels. Um, she actually starts to become Nelly. And in the end, at the last chapter, when he had told same thing where he's like, we're, we're leaving, pack up. And she packs everything and she's in the kitchen and all the boxes are there, but she is preparing his food and she answers the phone and says that her name is Nellie. And so you know that she's waiting for him to come home and she's about to poison him. So she doesn't have to move. So that's how the book was going to end. 
The problem is, and this is so true. And when I was writing it, I didn't, I didn't really think about it this way, but the issue around women going crazy and then doing bad things is such a trope in a lot of books and especially in thrillers. I mean, I personally feel like it's just been overdone. You know, this idea that the woman loses her marbles, she takes on a whole different personality and then everyone she's killed or she, whatever happens, you know, you're like, oh, it's because she's crazy. Um, And we just didn't want that for Alice. I wanted it much more to be that she was making a choice about what her future was going to look like. And so she was taking control back over over her life um, and and what she wanted that to be. So yeah, we we changed it. So I do sometimes get messages saying like, is Alice going to poison Nate in the end? Like, is this why she's kept the foxglove and... And no, she's not going to poison him. Like I said, he, they divorce and he remarries and has twins and he lives in a suburb not too far away. But she sort of always just, you know, I think for her, Nellie was really a talisman for her and that cookbook was a talisman for her. And it just gave her the confidence and the courage she needed to make those choices. So the foxglove stays because it keeps the deer out, but it also reminds her of, you know, why it's important to, um, to have your own life and to make your own choices. I love that you tell us what happens after because so many authors are like, well, whatever happens after is up to you. And everybody's like, no, we need to know what happens to these characters. I know. Well, the book ends like, you know, it's such a a strange thing as an author to figure out where a book ends. And for every book I have written, I just know it's like, I just, write something and I'm like, oh, that, that is the end. We are here. And usually, you know, you try to wrap up some of it, but I like to leave it a little bit open. So it's not entirely clear what's going to happen. Um, but I also like to finish my character stories like for myself. So then I decide what everyone has done and what's happened for them. And yeah. So then I share it. <laughs> That's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the research you did. Um, did you, first of all, when did you start writing this book? Was it, was it during, it was before the pandemic had started? Oh God. Yeah. I started writing it. So my debut published in 2015 Oh wow! and I had this, an idea for, I, I had this idea for Nellie. She came to me very clearly. I pictured her sitting in her garden, flipping through a cookbook um, trying to figure out what she was going to make for dinner and she's smoking her cigarettes, looking at her beautiful garden. But I knew there was something underneath the surface with her. And so I, I just had sort of playing with this idea and I pitched it to my editor because I had a two book deal with my debut. And I said, I'd really like to write this one as my second book. And they wanted, because I wrote, my first four books were sort of emotional women's fiction is what the publisher would call it. Um, sad books that make you cry. And, and um, they wanted more like that. So I sort of tucked this one aside and started working on a different story. And, but I didn't really, I just couldn't let it go. So I wrote this book in between all my other contracted books. I wrote it secretly and quietly and then it was done. And then my agent was like, yeah, let's sell it. So I ended up switching publishers actually with this book because the publisher who I was with wanted more of the more emotional stories that I had written. And I just didn't want to write those anymore. I wanted to write this book. So I switched publishers and here we are. Um, So that's a good segue, actually. We have so many questions for you, but that's a good segue into your newest book. (laughs) Yes. It's completely different. (laughs) Well, it's nonfiction. So it it was entirely different to write and it is an entirely different book. Yeah. It, that book, so I was adamant that I would never write a nonfiction book. Uh, my agent and I had talked about it one time after we had a meeting and she was like, what do you think about writing something around this 5 a.m. you know, writing habit you have? And I was like, oh, never. No, of course not. I'm not doing that. And I, I love writing nonfiction, but as a freelancer for magazines, I really enjoyed writing that type of, you know, like shorter form journalism where I'd have a chance to do the research and interviews and dive into some cool topics that I was interested in, but I just never considered doing it in a full book format. And then HarperCollins had 
uh, come to me and said, well, would you be interested in doing this? And we have a check for you if you would like to do it. And so in the publishing world, it's very hard to get checks. And so if you get a check, you say, okay, and then you figure out how to do it after. And it did not take me long to realize that writing a book about getting up at 5 a.m. is like a really short book because there is no secret. You set your alarm and you get out of bed and then you go do the thing you're going to do. So I had to look, I had to broaden it and look at what was the thing about getting up early for me that had allowed me to like not only take a hobby and turn it into a career, but it really changed the trajectory of my own life and, and what I've been able to do. And, you know, sometimes I can't believe I'm an author. I don't know how this happened. Um, sometimes a lot of work, a lot of 5am time, but yeah, it was, um, it, interestingly, it, it was the only book of mine that wouldn't be written at 5am. So I kept getting up early to write it. And it was like, nope, nope, there is nothing here for you this morning, Karma, on this book. So I, I wrote fiction and then I just worked on that one during the day. But it's, it's much closer to my journalism than it is to writing fiction, um, which is, you know, building the world and creating the characters and layering everything. This was in some ways a lot more personal because so much of my own story is in there. So it was, it was hard. It was, it was a different experience and I don't know that I'd do it again. Um, I'm not sure I have any more of my life to mine. Everything's pretty much in that book. So yeah, but fiction for me is like, that's what I love. That is what's fun for me, but I'm glad I did. I'm glad I wrote the 4% fix and I get lovely emails from people all the time who are using it to really look at having the opportunity to do something they've always wanted to do, but never felt they'd have the time to do it. And they start applying some of the, the things that I talk about in the book and the technique of getting up early and figuring out what it is you want to do and how to use that time. And so that's been nice. I'm happy to see that it's working for people. Very good. So we're going to dive back into the book because we have so many questions about the book specifically. Do it. Uh, Sarah wants to know if Nellie knew Richard was going to die, why not keep the baby and raise on her own since her concern seemed to be his effect on a child? Well, she didn't, and I think she says this in the book, because sometimes it's hard to remember because it book goes through so many edits and it's hard to remember what has stayed in. And because my, my world with Nellie is like this and what everyone else sees is like this. Um, she didn't feel she could risk that child being a boy and turning out like Richard. So she could never be sure if Richard was the way he was, like why he was the way he was. And I think for her, she was scared that she would bring a man into the world who could do damage to someone else like that. And she just didn't want to have any part of him with her. So I do get messages about that. People are upset that she did that. Uh, but, you know, the, the truth is there was a lot of, um, there are a lot of terrible things going on with women ending pregnancies and basement abortions and women dying. And, you know, so I was like, okay, she took a tea, you know, she took charge and, uh, but yeah, people do get upset and I understand it's one of those things that is sort of hard to accept. Like, why couldn't she just have raised that baby? But I mean, the truth is she didn't want to, and she made that choice. All right. Um, so Lola has a question about the cookies with the cloves in them and wants to know oh. if you ever made them because she thinks that's an odd ingredient. <laughs> I know it is. I have made them and it's good. And that's probably the recipe that gets made the most out of all the recipes in the book. I have a lot of Instagram squares with those recipes, with those cookies in them. So yeah, yeah, they're good. You can just, if you're not too sure about clove, you can try just a little tiny bit first and see what you think. But Lola, you'll have to report yeah, it be interesting. It's kind of Kind of like putting, you know, like uh, the Mexican hot chocolate has a little cayenne pepper in and it. Little, yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. I may try that. You can report back. Yeah, well, I'm I'm not eating sweet, so it may take a while. That's okay. It's all right. 
Uh, Katie wants to know what your inspiration for the book and did you always know that there would be two timelines? Which timeline did you start with first? Okay, um, the inspiration for the book, I, I should have grabbed it. I have an old cookbook called the Purity Cookbook and it, it came out in the 1940s and it was my stepmom's and she gave it to me. Um, I have a bunch of other cookbooks that have been passed down through my family. So they have all the notations in them. My mom loves to write in the margins and she'll say, you know, karma's 13th birthday. And then, you know, we always just remember that that's what we had that day. And she'll write if it was excellent or terrible or what it needs. And lots of like splashes across the page. So I just, I love vintage cookbooks. Um, I have ones in my own family, but I also have others that I have bought at used bookstores. And I think it just, you know, especially like back in the fifties where women had been out of the kitchen because the men had to go to war and the women had to come out of the kitchen in order to take over the jobs that the men had held before they went to war. And then the men came back and they got their jobs again. And the women went right back in the kitchen, like just sort of like, okay, now you are the domestic goddess. And I think for a lot of women at that time, they had ambition and dreams outside of that very specific role that they needed to hold, but they didn't have the opportunity to be able to voice that. And so uh, for me, some of these recipes and these cookbooks that these women would receive as shower gifts, and then it would be with them through their whole life until they would pass it down to, to their daughters. Um, you know, that was sort of their legacy and their, their voice can be found in there if you have those notations. So I knew I wanted to do something that had that legacy of women. And I love writing about food and putting little bits of food into all the books I do. So that, that fit well for me. Um, in terms of the timeline, it, because I, I wanted to look at the fifties, but I wanted to do a compare and contrast and look at how we have, how far we have we come, have we come as far as we think we have, and really taking a look at marriage then and marriage now and the expectations on women then and now. And I personally don't think that it has changed all that much. I do think that women have, and I'm speaking about white women right now, have a lot more rights than they did, but I don't think that on the whole society views women the same way, we're not equal. And so the, the, the shift for me looking at those two time periods, um, it was partly looking at that. You know, I was curious if how I would write those characters and what that would look like based on my own experience and the experience of people I know. Um, so the timelines, I wrote them back and forth. I went between Nellie and Alice in the 50s and 20. The 2018, I think so. I'm trying to remember what year it was and what year it is now. Um, I went between those two time periods, one and then the other. I think for that book, I had to do it that way because the there was so much integrated between them with the book, with the cookbook and the chapters in the house, or sorry, the cookbook, the recipes and the house that if I tried to write one of them all the way through, I may have lost the thread. Uh, but I'm working on a book right now that is another dual timeline. It's set in 1975 and 2019. And that one I actually wrote, I wrote the entire 2019 storyline. And then I wrote the entire 1975 storyline. And then I just put them together. Uh, so I'm editing that one now. But I think, you know, every book is just different, how you approach it and, and, what it ends up looking like through that process. So that's why every time I can sit down to write a book, I'm like, I don't remember how to do this. I know I have done this so many times before, but I don't think I know how to do this. Then I figure it out. But yeah, it's, um, I like writing the two timelines. It, that's been fun for me. It's fun to read as well. Yeah, I like reading it too. So that's one of the other things, but it's, it's nice to just, you know, you, you don't, I don't know. It's nice to flip back and forth. Um, what you were saying about the cookbooks sort of made me um, nostalgic and sad that we like we don't have cookbooks. We use these things now <laughs> and there's nowhere to annotate those like, oh, this is what we served on our 13th birthday. It's like it's nothing to pass down. Um, I buy a lot of cookbooks. I actually have a lot of even current cookbooks and I do write in them. 
um, because my mom wrote in them. And so that's just right. what I did. And now, and now it means even something more. And I will, I'm not as good about it as she is. Like she was just, she still is diligent about it. It's amazing. That's but amazing. yeah. I, I like make something and then I can't find the bloody recipe again online. That, so I don't you even need know to what get I get yourself some paper cookbooks. This should be your like goal. Like get a couple of paper cookbooks that you love and then just, you know, those become your legacy. Whatever that looks like going forward, you can mess those puppies up and get them nice and dirty and pages dog eared and everything. Yeah, I think you should. <laughs> I, I I think I will. I, I actually think I will buy a cookbook. <laughs> you will. Uh, if anybody has any recommendations, please put it in the chat window. <laughs> I don't know where Smitten, to start. Smitten with. Kitchen. Smitten Kitchen. Smitten is, kitchen. is amazing. Smitten. Yeah, she's a little. She works out of a little kitchen in New York City, and she had a blog for a long time, and then she started a cookbook, and her stuff is awesome. She has two cookbooks now. What's her name? Smitten Kitchen. S M I T T E N K I T C H E N. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Adele, I love your question and I think it's spot on. Adele says she really enjoyed the relationship between Nellie and her neighbor, being a support and an ally. Can you speak to that relationship for some of the other female relationships in the neighborhood? Yeah, I so I had like a really close relationship with my grandmother. Um, I have a really close relationship with my mom and my stepmom, and I love the wisdom of women. And I, I am sure in my twenties, I was, I thought I had it all figured out. I can absolutely say that. And now I have a almost thirteen-year-old, and she is convinced she has it all figured out. And I try to just not say, "Yeah, just wait," and she'll, she'll figure it out one day. But I. I think that um, especially not just women, but as we age, you know, I, I feel like I know a lot less about the world and how things work now than I did even 10 years ago. So having that ally and having that person who has had some more life experience and as you get older, some of the things you used to care about don't matter anymore. And there's something really special about being able to find somebody who you can have those conversations with and that friendship with and share, um, you know, not because you're going through something at the same time, but even if you're decades apart, you can share experiences and share advice and wisdom. And, you know, you keep each other young, you keep each other interesting. So with Miriam and Nellie, I knew that Nellie really needed a, a female role model, someone she could look up to, someone she could trust, um, someone who could be a dear friend for her. And that was Miriam. And also, you know, the same as with, with Alice and Sally. Sally really becomes that person for Alice too. Uh, Sally is in a lot of ways, like having, a, she has a quite opposite life from the one that Alice is about to sort of have because she didn't have children and she had a career and never married and um, you know, just having that person who can give you that wisdom and listen and really listen, uh, is it, that's hard to find. So that female friendship was important for me in that story. So I like those, those two characters as well. They were special for me. Uh, one of the questions we got emailed to us was, um, did we miss what Nellie was doing between her mother dying and marrying Richard? Did she work at all, go to school, or don't we know? She was in school, sort of like a finishing school, but was always like the goal was to get married. So that was what she thought she was supposed to do. And because she was alone, I think for her, part of that was also being a part of a family again was going to be important to her. All right, so talk to us a little bit about, so this book is out already or yes, it is. Yeah, yep. yeah. So this is out. And so you you talked about another book that has a dual timeline. Is that the one that you've co-authored? No, the, the dual timeline one will be my next standalone. It's the one that follows recipe for a perfect wife. Okay. Um, and it's set in the Adirondacks and it's set in 1975 during the second wave of feminism. And there's a, in that 1975 timeline, there's a character named Edith. She goes by Eddie 
And she's a someone who is quite a socialite and then had a um, complete reversal in her life. So she then ends up going and running one of these great camps in the Adirondacks and running these women, these wild women weekends to have women come and learn more about themselves and to really, you know, learn what it means to be a woman. This, a lot of this kind of thing was happening in the, the 1970s. And so this is what Eddie is doing. This is her life passion. And in 2019, Rowan is a screenwriter who has come to the Adirondacks with her fiance for a month. They're house sitting this little cabin in the woods. And she is, again, like there's a, there's a lot of um, themes around ambition here and ambition with women and men and what that looks like when you're in a relationship. There's a discovery that she makes that connects her story to Eddie's story and everything. I can't really talk about it because then I'll give things away, but everything comes together and, and her whole life sort of changes over that month because of what she discovers in the woods. So that's what I'm working on now. It's out in 2023. Oh, wow. <laughs> January, 2023, the publishing, the publishing journey is a long one. It takes, you know, it's just, usually it's about two years from the time you write a book to when it actually shows up on the shelf. Um, but I have co-authored a holiday romance, which was Honestly, it started as a joke <laughs> and my friend, Marissa Stapley and I, uh, Marissa is also an author in Toronto. She, her latest is Lucky, which just came out and we, it was just before Recipe for Perfect Wife was about to launch and it was just before Christmas and I was like antsy pre book launch time is a very strange time for an author. You feel like you should be doing all kinds of things, but there's nothing yet to do. And so you're sort of, it's like, I think anticipating, you know, the birth of a baby, it feels very important and urgent, but you, there's nothing to do. So you spend a lot of time, you know, just sort of spinning in circles. And Marissa was deep in an edit that was not going well. And so we were talking one day and we were like, wouldn't it be great? Because it's really isolating doing this work sometimes, you know, you're on your own for a long time, thinking about these characters, writing, not really talking to anyone about it. And we thought, well, wouldn't this be great if we wrote a book together? Then we're never alone. We're, we're always doing this together. And so we thought, well, what would we write? And it was right when all the Hallmark Christmas movies were coming out. So I was wrapping Christmas presents and watching all these Hallmark Christmas stories. And I was like, Christmas, like, let's do a Christmas movie or a Christmas book. You know, it's happy and we'll do like a fun romance. And it, it will just be different because we write more angsty style books. So we were like, okay, let's do this. And then I actually don't even know what happened. We, we wrote an outline and then we started writing and we flipped back and forth with the chapters. And then we had a half a book and then we sold it. And then we now are publishing it under Maggie Knox. That's our pen name. Uh, it's coming out in October. So it's fun. It was really fun and different. And romance is a blast. <laughs> you're guaranteed a happy ending. I mean, really, like, is there anything better than that? Even as an author, when I'm writing, you know, the, the characters in the romance, I, I know that they're just going to end up together. It's just a matter of how you get them there. And that's not always true, obviously, with my <laughs> other books. So, so I had a busy pandemic year. We'll just put it that way. It was, there was a lot of writing happening, but. That's good though. I think it's a good job to have during a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, except everyone was home. Oh. You know, I work from home, but I have a kid who's at school and a husband who was like out of the house every day. And then everybody was home. And I was like, what's happening? Why is everyone home? And why is there so much mess? And why is my husband so loud on every conference call he does? This is the thing I have learned. I, I don't know if this is a gender thing and uh, someone tell me, but he's so loud when he talks on the phone. Has anyone else noticed this in the pandemic? Do you have a spouse who is just suddenly there taking conference calls all day? Yeah. Yes. I feel you. <laughs> yes. Okay. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us are there. So hugs so, to us. Karma, I just have a few fun questions to finish off our interview with, um, just to get to know you a little bit better as an author or as a person rather. Sure. <laughs> um, so the first question is, what are you doing if you're not writing? 
what am I doing if I'm not writing? I am baking. I'm a, a procrastinate baker. So like this week alone, I have made <laughs> pumpkin cookies, two pumpkin loaves, a banana loaf. I think that's it, but it's Thursday. I have baked every day. Um, <laughs> I feel like the lockdown is getting a little intense, right? So I feel like I'm baking a lot because it feels super productive and I don't want to leave my house. So I'm baking. I do love to work out. I decided a few years ago, I didn't want to be weak anymore. I mean, I have always exercised, but I was like, I want to like have strong muscles. So I started CrossFit, which was terrifying. And I I'm it's been years and I'm sore every single workout. I don't understand what's happening, but I, the, every time after work at the next day, I'm like, I can't walk. I can't lift my arms. Like I've been doing this for three years. So, um, I and I read as well. So I understand. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I was honestly trying to explain the other day to someone. I was like, I don't understand why I'm so sore. I, it's not like I've taken a month off. I took a day off. So <laughs> I don't know, but it's fun. CrossFit's fun. And I like having muscles so I can lift heavy things. But um, yeah, I just, you know, I have a dog, Fred, my Labradoodle Fred, who is like my second child. And we spend a lot of time together. Fred hears about all my books and we talk about them. He's a very good sounding board. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm a bit of a homebody. Outside of those things, like in the before times, I probably got dragged out to parties and other things, but usually kicking and screaming. I'm a bit of an introvert. So, yeah. Um, do you have a favorite bookshop in the world? Oh, in the world. It's a big question. I don't know. <laughs> I can't choose. That's a big question. I love my local indie bookstore, which is a different drummer books for anyone who's local. We have um, a, a novel spot drummer. in Toronto is one of my favorites. If you... Where? There's one in Burlington called something Little Drummer no. Boy or something. Little... No, it's a different drummer. Okay. It's funny that a different both... drummer book. It's funny that there's drummer in both of them though. <laughs> really? I've never seen the Little Drummer one. I'll have to go looking for them. Um, and Blue Heron books, if anyone knows Blue Heron know books, they're great too. Anyway, there's so many, yeah. And I do love chapters. Like in, I one of my favorite things to do was to go to chapters and just browse through all the books and get a coffee and spend like a couple of hours doing that and then leaving with a big stack. My husband is, I get a lot of books also sent from publishers and from my publisher and other publishers, they want me to read books and and I buy a lot of books and I take a lot of books out of the library. And every day I feel like there's a book on my like front step. And my husband is always like, uh, we don't need any more books. <laughs> like I, you know what I do for a living, right? Like this, there will always be books and so many books, but you need a free little library. I do. I do need a free little library. I do take boxes of them. Like I'll take a box to the CrossFit gym or I'll take a box to the library. This is in the before times, of course. So Maybe when we're back in more normal times, I'll be able to get rid of some and pass them along. But I have a lot of favorite books. I dog ear my books. I know that upsets a lot of people, but I am not a bookmark user. I am like, you fold that page and you make it nice and nice and crisp on that edge. I know that upsets people. I'm sorry if that upsets anyone here, but I'm a dog ear. All right. So a physical book, ebook, or audiobook? Physical book, but I do read my Kobo every night to fall asleep. I can't fall asleep without, usually it falls like on my face. That's when I know it's right. I'm ready to, <laughs> to go to sleep. Um, but yeah, I'm a physical book person for sure. And I spend so much time writing and looking at my screen. So I, there's just something really special about holding the book. Agree. Um, so the last question we have for you tonight is we're always on the hunt for our next great read. Um, do you have any books that you suggest that we look for or look into? There's a lot. <laughs> um, well, I mean, Mexican Gothic, has anyone read that book? We read her last book. We didn't read this one yet. Okay. Mexican Gothic is amazing. I, I have actually truthfully had a very hard time reading during the pandemic. I've written 
thousands and thousands of words, but for some reason, my ability to read, which is crazy because I can read a book in a day, but it has been, it has gone and I hope it comes back. So I've basically only been reading horror for a year because I can't, it's the only thing that I can just, I know, isn't that strange? It's worse than the pandemic. So it feels like you know, it, nothing will be as bad as what's happening in these books. Um, but anyway, I, Mexican Gothic is a, uh, it's a Gothic horror set in a house and I loved it. It's creative and weird and awesome. Um, my, I have a couple of good friends, like, as I said, Marissa Stapley, her latest book, Lucky is about a, um, grifter who, She's a young woman and she has a winning lottery ticket, which she can't cash because she's on the run. And so it's a really sort of fun caper. Story. She does historical fiction, but our drug is very. heartbreak I mean like I said it's been horror I've been reading a lot of Shirley Jackson like as a book club she's Canadian a gutter child I haven't read gutter I don't know it's such a hard question for me I should come with the list I don't know why I'm never prepared for this question it comes up every <laughs> single time I'll do better I'll do better next time um, thank you so much for talking with us. It was a real pleasure to hear all the ins and outs of the book and what's coming up next for you. And um, maybe we'll be doing this again when you're uh, in, in two, I guess, 2023. <laughs> yeah, like January 2023. I'll be at it again. So yeah, that would be great. Well, thank you so much. It was it was fun chatting tonight and for all the great questions. And yeah, it was that hour went very fast. So thank you. Thank you ladies for joining us. See you at book club. <laughs>